Well, as we start off with flipping our classroom in FST, um, what you're going to find is we're going to cover a variety of topics. And what the FST stands for is F is for the functions component, which is really going to be more higher level algebra 2. S is the statistics component, which will give you your stats credit. And the T is for uh, more of the trigonometry, which is a precursor to pre-calculus, which will give you that introduction. Now we start off in chapter one, which is a stats topic, and it's about exploring data. Um, I like starting in chapter one because it's not overly complex. Um, you will be using your calculator for a variety of activities within the chapter. However, on the test, I'm not going to let you use your calculator because I want you to show me how you would do the steps um, by hand. You may not have to do the final computations if they're long and laborious, but you would write out, for example, if I asked you how to find the mean of the data set, you would write out how to find it. If it involved adding up 50 numbers, I wouldn't require you to do that on the actual test. But during the course here, you would be doing that within your homework, which you do want to know how to do. Now this first bit of notes is section 1.1. In front of you here is a list of objectives. We have 21 objectives that you're, we're going to cover in chapter 1. And the nice thing about the first section, it's one objective. You are going to learn how to read tables and make conclusions based on the information. Um, so let's just go ahead and start doing that. So get out your note packets and fill in the notes as we go. The first section is 1.1 on variables, tables, and graphs. And let's take a look at this introductory problem. It says here, examine each cause of unintentional injury death for the age or ages at which that cause is most prominent. Um, they want us to look at four of the different types of deaths and read the graph. Let's just do the first one together. Um, what did we find for the motor vehicles? What is the most pro uh, prominent age where the death happens? What you want to do is first come over to the graph and look at the title. Um, it says here it's unintentional injury death by age and event in the U.S. for 2004. If you look at the x-axis, you're going to notice that we are dealing with the ages in their years, and the y-axis is dealing with death. It looks like counts. Take a look at that y-axis and see if it's counting by tens or thousands or millions, and you don't see anything. So those are the actual death counts. Now, part A is asking for motor vehicles. So we look here, the motor vehicles are identified with the red and the x, and we're going to see that this red graph peaks somewhere in this range. And if you read down on the x-axis, you might assume that it's a between about 19 and 21 year olds, which should make sense. These are the people who have not been driving that long. They might tend to be a little more reckless, um, and therefore we are seeing the actual real life data back in 2004 shows us um, for that age group, this is really the, the most um, major cause of unintentional injury death. Now I want you to pause the video and just take a look at part B, C, and D and try to read on the graph where you think is the particular range, again, where that uh, age for that death is the most pr predominant. So pause the video, take about 30 seconds, and replay it and see if you got it right. Now let's just take a quick look at the falls. We're going to notice that the falls are marked with the blue line uh, that is dominated with a circle, and that's going to be somewhere in this range here. It looks like that the most unintentional injury deaths related to falls are for people in the age group of about 83 years old. So give or take, let's say, two years high or two years low on that if you got that for the age group. It makes sense, right? The elderly people. Um, for poisoning, that one is going to be using, uh, we are back kind of to this uh, yellowish red line with the triangle, and poisoning happens at about the age of 40. And then suffocation, we're going to see, is with the blue, with the rectangle as the indicator. And the highest rate of deaths for suffocation is about around the age 85. Again, plus or minus two ages high or two ages low. Do we think these statistics are helpful or useful? Sure. Um, this is factual information. It's, again, reported um, for our case, it's somewhat old because it's back in 2004, but it does uh, give us an idea of maybe if we were the government and wanted to curb some of the deaths for teenagers, uh, we might put a public service announcement on TV, make a commercial, and we would target it about motor vehicles. 
If it was something we were concerned about for the elderly people, we might come back and look at falls and suffocation and put some type of public service announcement on TV to help make them more aware of the high number of deaths in those areas. Now I have about five slides of problems I want to go through, but before we do the problems, let's get the new vocabulary out of the way and in our brains. Um, first thing is statistics. Um, statistics is defined as being the branch of math that deals with collecting, organizing, then we're going to analyze, interpreting of data. So we're going to uh, collect some data, organize it, analyze it, and then interpret what we found. Now what is data? Uh, data is just information used in statistics. And it is usually of numerical value. Not always. It may also be of what we call categorical. And you are going to want to know the difference between numerical and categorical. Numerical is something I would ask you, how old are you? And you would give me a number in terms of your age. Categorical, if I wanted to gather data about what color are your eyes, uh, your answer would be more qualitative. It would be an actual word and not a number. So that's the difference between if a piece of data is categorical versus numerical. A numerical, we can actually compute an average based on the data itself. A variable is what we call is a character used to represent a person or a thing. If we gather some data, it might be numerical data, we might say let's, let's call all of our data that we collect A. So A stands for all of your ages and I would list all of the ages underneath the letter A. A population is a blank of all individuals or objects being studied. A population would be the set of all individuals or objects being studied. The sample, therefore, comes from the population. So a sample is a subset of a population. For example, if I wanted to know um, how all high school students in Mount West Tonka felt about something, um, I may not want to have to go and ask all 800 students at the high school, which is the population. I might want to just take a sample. Maybe I would ask our particular FST class, you know, 20 to 30 students, how they felt, and then make some inferences about the entire school just based on that sample that we took. Now to gather some information I'm going to do a survey and a survey is the gathering of facts or opinions through either an interview or a questionnaire. So you might give someone a piece of paper to fill in some questions or you might just sit down with them and verbally ask them some questions. Now a census, this happens, it's a survey of the entire U.S. population, and this happens every single 10 years. And typically what they do is uh, the government hires individuals that are going to send you some paperwork, and if you fill that out, and it says how many people live in the household. Um, if you don't answer your paperwork, typically they will have someone come and knock at your door and actually ask you for a physical count. It's a pretty tedious process, but it's done every 10 years. Uh, the population signs that you see when you drive by them going from city to city, those are then updated every 10 years with the new population counts. A representative sample is just a sample that has the same characteristics as the population. So again, let's say I wanted to know the population of the Mount West Tonka High School students. I would want to take a sample of a nice representation of the students. Maybe get a variety of students, get a handful of boys and girls, maybe different age groups. Um, I wouldn't want to go ask the people in the office their opinion because they are not a representation of the students themselves. Now one of the things you are going to be asked on a quiz and a test both is you'll be given a scenario and you need to identify the variable, the population, and the sample that is being studied. Here we go. Here's a, a question for you. A medical laboratory technician draws 10 milliliters of blood in order to determine the number of white blood cells in a patient's bloodstream. Identify for me the variable, the population, and the sample. Um, the variable is what's being studied. Okay. So why don't you just take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can figure out these three on your own, and then replay the video, and we'll see if you got it right. Did you realize that the variable being studied here is the number of white blood cells? 
you have to be very specific in here. It just isn't the blood. It's not the patient's blood. It specifically says the number of white blood cells is what they are counting. Okay. The population in this case is going to be all of the patient's blood. That's the entire population. It's all the blood going through their body. And the sample that we're taking in this one is specifically a drop of the patient's blood, or even more specifically, a 10 milliliters of the patient's blood. Now, in statistics, you do want to be more specific than less specific. Um, if you think you're being too wordy, you probably aren't, but just make sure to give enough information. Here's our second example of five um, in just reading a table. And let's just look at the problem and dive right into it. It says here in Boston, 2,145 selected inline skaters were chosen for a survey and asked to classify their ability as beginner, average, or advanced. They were also asked whether they, were, uh, prote they wore protective gear like helmets, knee pads, shin pads, and elbow pads when skating. The data were organized in a table like that shown below. One thing I want you to notice here, by the way, the word data. Uh, data is the same if it's singular or plural. So just make note of that, that this is grammatically a correct way to say it. The data were. Now, before you start answering a question, just take a look at the table, what we're looking at. Here are the various levels of skill set. Here's the amount of protective gear worn. Um, and it shows right here from no gear to giving us the total. And let's take a look at these six questions. Are the data that they have here based on a sample or the entire population? Take a moment to think about it, pause the video, and start it up again when you're ready. Okay. On this one, what you should have realized, this is actually based on a sample. And this is a little tricky. They said they selected 2,145 inline skaters. Um, so they actually went and selected these people from a population. We're not sure what the population was. In, in this case, I would probably say the population was the entire city of Boston, what would have been the population. In the sample are these inline skaters who were physically in Boston at that time. So this is just a sample. Uh, what variables are being represented here? Uh, you could say the amount of protective gear being worn. And then part C, what percent of skaters wore no gear? One thing you want to remember about these types of questions is a percent. A percent is a simple calculation, but people will forget this or mix it up. It's the part over the whole, right? If I have, for example, a 12-pack of soda in the room and I've drank two sodas, what percent of the sodas have I drank? Well, the part was two sodas out of a total of 12. Figure that out and get the percent, okay? So let's answer that question. What percent of skaters wore no gear? When you take a look at that, of all the skaters who wore no gear, there we have the, all of them that wore no gear were 874. Um, so of the skaters that wore no gear, I would say 874 is the part divided by the whole, which is right here, 2145. Put that in your calculator and get a decimal, and then times that by 100 to get the percent, and you're going to have about a 40.7% of the skaters wore no gear at all. Okay. I want you to pause the video and try to do parts D, E, and F on your own. Play the video, check the answers. Go ahead and do it, pause the video. Okay, the three respective answers you should have gotten. What percent of beginners wore no gear? about 26.5 percent. Part E, the answer was 754 people. Part F was 382 people. If you got those, go ahead and fast forward to the next slide. If not, listen up. Part e, D, what percent of beginners wore no gear? They want to know the percent of the beginners. So of the beginners, there were only 709 people that were beginners. Of those that wore no gear, 188. So do 188 over 709, get the decimal, times it by 100, we have about 26.5%. Okay. 
Part E is asking how many. How many is a count. This is not a percent. How many skaters said that they were advanced? Don't overcomplicate it. The advanced skaters you're going to find, it's, here's total advanced, right there, 754. And then how many advanced skaters actually wore protective gear? What you're going to do is look at the advanced skaters, the ones that wore protective gear were either these folks or these folks here. Add it up, you get the 382. Now the suggestion I can give you is when you're asked to look at a table and draw some conclusions, you want to ask yourself three questions. The first question is, ask what is being presented. This is where you want to pause and take a look at the actual table to see what we have. Take a look at this table here, it's actually somewhat involved. Um, if you look at the title, it's the income of households by highest education level of householders in 2005. So if we look at this, we have people's education. And if we look at here, we have a combination of things. We have first income levels. Then we also have here number of households. And we have the medium income levels for these various education purposes. So for example, um, in a household, someone that had some college this is how many people, the number of households. By the way, this is in thousands. Be very careful. So that's not 28,000. That's actually 28 million. It's in thousands at three zeros. Now, that's an actual count. When we get to these next bits here, be careful. Look at the table. These are the percents. So this is the percent of their income. So in a household where their people had some college but not quite a degree, um, this is the percent in here, 16.1% of them made over $100,000, whereas 5.7% made under $10,000. Okay. This last bit here is the median income of that uh, level of college. About $50,000 was the median or the middle, the 50th percent person sat there. Okay. Second thing you want to ask yourself up here is, are the data trustworthy? Um, to do that, just take a look at the data sources, read the table, and our data source is actually right down here. Here it says it comes from the U.S. Census Bureau population survey back in 2006. Okay, do we trust the source? Is it a reasonable source? We should assume if it's from the U.S. Census Bureau, that is from the government, that this is valid and good information. You might want to think, is it really old information? Maybe we want newer information. So just think about the source. And then the last thing you want to do is think about what conclusions can be drawn. Is this table even important to put together or did someone just waste their time gathering this data? I think one of the things you can do as a conclusion, there is a nice conclusion from this table, especially if you look at the median income. Um, the median income you're going to see gets higher as you have more education. Well, that makes sense. That's something we would probably assume would be the case. But when someone gathered this data and organized it, in this table, we can clearly see that the higher your education level here as it goes up, your median income also went up. Now this is really, uh, it's our second to last slide, but it's the, really the last big problem. And we're going to end up using that education data. So let's just dive right into it and see how we can answer our questions with this. Okay, part A. What variable is represented by the row headings and what kind of variable is it? What is the other variable in the table? So if we look at the row headings, what you're going to see, these are the rows, right? Rows go, don't forget, they're the horizontal. Those are rows. Columns go down. Those are the columns. Okay. So if you look at the row, what kind of variable is represented? What we have here is this data. And it's your highest level of education. So you could just jot that down. Now, what they want you to, to answer is when they say what type of variable is it, is it a numerical or categorical variable? When they knock on the door and they ask someone uh, this interview question, um, the answer was a sentence. That in itself is a categorical variable. Okay, So categorical is the type of variable that is. Uh, and the second part of this question is what is the other variable in the table? And we touched on that a little bit already. It talks about their income level. So this table deals with your level of education 
and your income level that you have. All right, part B. Uh, what kinds of information are presented in the columns? What columns correspond to each kind? Okay, so the type of information in the columns, what you could say, um, you're going to have a variety of things. We have three different types of column information. We have number of households, so you could put that. We have distribution of income. That could be another thing, so put distribution of income. And then we have the median income. What columns correspond to each kind? What they just want you to get from that is when you look at the number of households, that's a count. It's in thousands. Okay. So again, we talked about this right here a little bit, but this 31,153 households means it's in thousands, so add three zeros behind it. It's really 31,153,000 households. Uh, this next section, the percent distribution of income, what you're going to notice, and they just want you to see the connection, if you add up all of these columns, and in this case we have, it looks like eight, if you add up all those numbers, it's going to come back to 100%. Okay? And then the last column deals with a medium income, and that's in dollars, um, so it's as straightforward as that. Okay, part C. Interpret the table entry 31153 in a sentence describing its context. Um, here it is. We actually kind of touched on it already. Here's what I would say for Part C. Um, part C says that in about, state this properly, 31,153,000 households people had a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, what you also could have said for this in context is this. You could have said, instead of writing out the number like this, you could have written 31,153 and then put the word thousands behind it. That would have been acceptable also. All right, let's wrap this up. Part D says here, write a statement relating median income to the education of uh, the householder. So here we, what I'm going to do is just get my eyeballs on median income and the education of the householders. Again, we kind of talked on this a little bit already. If you look at the connection, you're going to see these values increase as the education increases. So what you could do for part D is say something along the lines of as um, the education in the household increases, so does the median income. And that's what you could do for Part D. Part E is the last one here. How many times is likely was a family to have an income of at least 100000 if the head of household had graduated college rather than not started high school? I want you to pause the video on here and go to the table and figure out what information exactly are you looking at. So go ahead, reread this question, and identify which cells in this table do we want to look at and restart the video and we'll see if you got it. Now what you should have realized is this, the two blue circles identify uh, the cells we're looking at. Uh, so we had income of at least $100,000 if the head of household had graduated college. That's right here, this cell. Rather than not, had started high school. Um, the folks that didn't start high school making $100,000 are right here. So we have the two pieces of data but we have not answered the question. How many times is likely was this to happen over this? What you can do is take the 36.2 divided by the 2.2. You're going to get approximately 16 times more likely. Um, so it is 16 times more likely that if someone is making over $100,000, the chances are they have a college degree or higher versus they had never started high school. All right, the last slide, I just want us to talk about different types of bar graphs you might see. Um, first thing here, uh, you're going to see two different bar graphs. Okay, We have a uh, bar graph here, and here we have a stacked bar graph. Um, so part A here says, typically bar graphs are used to determine or support conclusions. Uh, bar graphs are a great way 
to have a visual representation of to support your conclusion. Okay. Part B, uh, things with bar graphs. They are appropriate when one variable is categorical and the other is numerical. For example, you're going to see here, um, if we look here, we're back to the Boston uh, people that were inline skating, and we had either a beginner skater, an average, or an advanced skater. They went and they asked these people what type of skater they were. They gave a word answer. They said, I'm a beginner skater. It wasn't a numerical answer. Well, they had some counts. So the answer itself was categorical, but they counted the data of how many people said that, which was numerical. So we have a combination of categorical and numerical. Great type of information to put in a bar graph. All right, part C, well-made bar graphs. What do they look like? First thing, they have a descriptive title. Every graph you look at or you make needs to have a title. It, it's necessary. Uh, number two, it identifies the variable being described. Um, if need be, we're going to have either a key or a legend, like this graph has a key or a legend identifying the variables, or in this case here, it's higher education level, we get the information from the title and from the axes. All right, part three. You're going to label the numerical scale in equal intervals. This may sound basic, but if you take a look, for example, at this graph here, the tick marks are equally balanced. We have from 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80. They're nicely and equally spaced out. If you do not equally space out your tick marks, your graph is going to be garbage, and it's not even worth making it. Do it right. Part number four, um, we're going to use bars of equal width. Again, looking at these two graphs, they, all of their bars are the same width. If, for example, maybe on this uh, graph on the left, if this little bar right here about our, how much education you have, if that bar was a lot wider or fatter, your eye might go to it more. and You might read it a little bit differently and kind of skew what you're thinking. So make sure the bars are e of equal width. And the last thing is provide a legend, or in this case, sometimes we'll call it a key or a legend, if uh, data from more than one sample is shown. And this right here, uh, this stacked bar graph, has three different types of data within it, obviously color-coded, so you can see that. Okay. Uh, and go ahead, and we'll take a look at the assignment. Now, as of now, in the book, the assignment is scheduled to be number 2 through 17 on the designated pages. Um, I will let you know when you get to class if I do shorten this. Um, so it's possible that it might be slightly shortened. Uh, so good luck on the homework and let me know what questions you have. Also, hopefully you're listening to this before we're in class. Uh, so if you are, be prepared to do an entrance card where you can actually get one bank point um, and possibly some modified or shortened homework assignments. So good luck with that.